Memorizing lines well. This is incredibly important because the idea is not to remember the lines, but to know the lines, to have them inside you, to be absolutely confident about what you are saying. And here are 10 tips which could help you get to that point. First thing is time. I, I think it helps if we put some time aside and say, OK, for the next two hours, I am going to study my lines or the monologue or the scene or whatever it is. And the first hour probably will be a bit slow going and it'll be a bit hard or hard to keep going. But the second hour will move along faster. And at the end of those two hours, you will know your lines better. So switch off your phone, maybe set the alarm on something else and avoid any calls from interruptions from anyone else. And, and know that you've got those two hours that you are going to, in two hours from now, know your lines better. And the second thing, before I come to more specific little hints, which would help you faster, is space. Yes, set out the space that you're going to be going through your lines in, a bit to look like the space in the studio or the stage scene that you're doing. So you've got a couple of books on the floor to show where the door is and a table and a chair if you need them and uh, maybe a, a coat if you have to put something on at some point. It, not loads of things, but just something so that you feel like you're in the scene. You're not just looking at a book at a desk. OK, now we, we've got to keep at this. We, we can't stop halfway through the two hours. And the one way to keep at it, this may sound silly, but well, it works for a lot of actors. So. You take a piece of paper and you tear it in half and then in quarters and then in eighths and you write on the first piece of paper the number one on the next number two up to the number eight and you take the first and you put it on the other side of the room and then you do the first run of your scene or the whole act or whatever you've got to do and when you've done that you take number two and you put that on the other side of the room and you work through till you've done number eight. And something about this silly exercise means that, well, you do get it done eight times. And you could, if you wanted to, at the end of all that, go to the other side of the room and bring the numbers back again. So you do it 16 times. If you're Anthony Hopkins, you'll do it a lot more times than that. And another thing is to, uh, you may know this one, but it's worth doing, to take a piece of paper and cover your script so that the... So that the, maybe the last letter, or, or the most the last word, all the way down the script, is covered. And you can still probably read through the whole thing, and then move the script page across a bit so that you're covering the last two words, and carry on till you've only got the first word of the line all the way down. And you'll probably find that you can go through the whole thing without looking much. But I started this off about saying about knowing lines. If you just learn lines and remember them, well, you can forget them, which easily happens. You don't want to forget them. They want them to be in you, not on some damn script. So you have to know what the lines mean to you. And so if you've got a line, you're playing a doctor and you're saying the line, don't worry, you're going to be fine. Underline the most important word in each sentence. You don't want them to worry. You don't want them to think about when they're going to be fine. You want to say, don't worry, you're going to be fine. Fine is probably the most important word of the sentence. And there's only one important word in a sentence, so get to know it. Get to know what your script is about quickly. And also what the lines really mean, so that if the doctor's saying that to a patient and he's Tom Cruise playing this part, then he probably means that he likes the person he's talking to and he'd like to take them out for a drink. So when he says, don't worry, you're going to be fine, he's shutting them up. Right. So know what your lines really mean. Difficult words. And this, all these ideas may come together for some of you, that you'll use two or three of them at once. The actor Hugh Laurie, who plays the lead in that television series House, he has to remember lots of medical terms. And if we've got a part in which we've got difficult names to remember, or if in life we've got lots of names of the cast that we want to remember, You've got to make a subtext, you've got to make a meaning, a fun reason for them. I'm quite sure that Hugh Laurie, even though his father may be a doctor and he may have studied medicine, I'm sure that when he remembers all the medical terms in house, it's because he's made up some funny reason in his mind of what the word actually means, something funny, something that he will remember forever. I'm having to have a conversation with some people about the television series Better Call Saul. 
and I want to remember the names of all the casts and what the parts they play are. And some of them are quite difficult names to remember, so how would I do that? Well, the lead is played by a chap called Jimmy, and Jimmy is an easy name to remember because for me, because I just look at it and I don't have to think about it, I just think Jimmy, Jimmy, Jimmy. It's a very famous name of one of the first parts I ever played in a famous play called Look Back in Anger years ago. And he's played by an actor whose name is a little difficult to remember, and he's called Bob Odenkirk. Bob Odenkirk. The character he's playing is a clown. And there's a very famous clown, if you look up Wikipedia, called Bobo. And so Bobo starts the name off, Bob O, and a friend of mine called Bob ran a church in Scotland, and the Scottish word for church is Kirk. So Bob then Kirk, Bob den Kirk, Bob den Kirk. Bob Oden Kirk. Bobo, Bob Oden Kirk. Yes, I've got it now, Bob Oden Kirk. His love interest in the series is a wonderful actor called Shay, called Ray, Ray Seahorn. And I just remember her name because R-H-E-A is how she spells her first name. So I noticed that. I noticed the E-A because Seahorn, Seahorn, Seahorn is spelt S-E-E. And when I was a boy, there was a, an aquarium locally where they had these funny fish which were called seahorses. So I remember, she doesn't look like a horse at all, but she's, I remember the name sea, sea I associate it with the word, with the, with the sea, S-E-A. So we've got E-A and E-E, -E. that's in my mind, and so that's all I have to remember. I can remember, therefore, that she's called Ray Seahorn. The actor who plays Mike, and Mike's my brother's name, and there are three Mikes in the show, so that's easy to remember, and he's called Jonathan Banks. And that's easy to remember because there's a director of a very good theatre company off-Broadway in New York, and he's called Jonathan Bank. And also in the series, this character, he has to put some money into a bank to give to his granddaughter when she's older, which is something I'd like to do for my granddaughter. So it's fairly easy to remember Jonathan Banks. Then there's an actor, and he's just such an incredibly good actor. He's the leader of a cartel. He's making drugs, but he is so completely in charge. He's like a king. And he's also called John. And Juan Carlo, he's South American, Juan Carlo was the king of Spain 20 years ago. So I remember his first name, Juan Carlo. And his second name is difficult to remember. But in the series, there is a fantastic scene when there's an explosion. And something about the word explosion just I associate with this character. And his name is Esposito. So he's Juan Carlo Esposito. And now I know his name, I'm going to look out for it in every film list I see in case he's in it, so I know I want to watch the film. He's just fantastic. Then there are two more. Then there are two more. Okay, so I'm going to turn this off because that's my phone. Stop ringing. Then there are two more Michaels in it. And one of them plays a character called Nacho. And I remember the Nacho because... The name, actor's name is Mando, and there's a very famous American film director called Michael Mann. So it's fairly easy to remember that he's called Mike Mando, and he's so good at playing this really aggressive killer. He would be scary to just meet in a rehearsal, he's so good. He naturally plays Nacho, so I can remember the character's name, and I can remember that he's called Mike Mando. And the other Michael in it plays a character called Chuck, and his name starts off or has a CK in it. It's called Muck something. And there's another off-Broadway theatre company in New York called The Keen Company, and he's called Michael McKean. So that we got Michael McKean and Mike Mando. A seventh character that I'll just remember now, he's the boss of Ray Seahorn. And he's a bully. And he wears shirts like a friend of mine called Pat. And he's a bully, and there's a bully in Shakespeare's play Twelfth Night called Fabian, and his name's Patrick Fabian. So it's fairly easy for me to look at the name and think, yes, he's a bully, Patrick Fabian, I'll remember that. And the names are beginning to be my names. They're mine. I remember them as if they were people I know, because I've made something out of their names. I'll remember them for 20 years. And the first of these last three ideas is... Oh, to write out the lines, yes. It, it always feels a bit silly, but 
It means that another part of your brain is knowing what the lines look like, what they feel like in your own handwriting when you write out all of your lines. So do it. You want them to be yours, you want them to be in you, though you want them to be never to be forgotten. You've written the damn lines out. It's as if you'd written the thing in the first place. And when you're going through the lines lots of times, try them in different ways, just a bit. Allow your character to be a bit more confident, allow the character to be a bit more shy, allow the character to be at a party on their birthday, allow the character to be angry. Just It may help you discover some of the lines, but just to give it variety so that you're ready for anything, that the lines are so solid in you, you don't have to think about the lines when you go on stage or in front of the camera, you just go on, because you know the lines are going to come out because they're solid. And you've thought of so many ways of doing them that you just react to whatever happens around you when you're there, and they say action. The last thing, you record the other people's lines, or you can buy, get an app quite easily that does this, but you record the other people's lines, and you leave gaps for you to say your lines. And if you need a huge gap, because you've got a long speech at some point, and you don't know how long to leave that gap, then instead of leaving any gap at all, just make a noise and go straight on with recording the other people's lines. Because then when you're listening to the tape, and you hear that noise, you'll know to press pause, as it will give you lots of time to say your long speech. And then you release the pause button, and their next line comes in. It's so wonderful. It's so... There are other words I could use. It's just so wonderful to know your lines really well. Michael Caine and Anthony Hopkins can do their lines backwards very occasionally, literally backwards from the end of the script to the beginning. And they could certainly go through the whole play forwards, including everyone else's part. They just know it. And it just... It just makes life easier. I don't really know how other actors manage if they can't do the whole show on their own. Or they don't need to, and they don't need to do what silly things I do, and that's absolutely fine. Do whatever you want. But the joy of knowing your lines as well as you possibly ever want to makes this business a hundred times more fun. Thank you for watching.